Hello, we're going to go over the 10 toughest terms in the research methods unit here. Um, we've gone over these terms in the previous video casts, but uh, we're going to go over them again to try to have them all in one place for you. So here we go. Um, number one is an operational definition. Uh, we have, a lot of students have trouble with this in class, of being able to define things. So operational definition is very precise, it's very exact, it tells you exactly um, what you're talking about describes the concept, but importantly, it uh, states the term um, or the concepts and tells you how they're going to be measured or what operations are going to be used uh, or employed to produce them. So, like one of the key words you want to think about here, if this comes up on an FRQ or you're asked an essay about this, it, measured. How are you going to measure it? How do you measure if it's if your question is um, who will the little boy laugh at more, girls or adult girls or adult boys, right? Well, when you're measuring, you're measuring how much he laughs or the number of times they laugh, okay? So your measurement is what you're trying to define there. Um, so keep in mind, you always want to learn how to measure, especially when you're talking about the dependent variable. It's how are you going to measure it. Moving on to... Random sample, random assignment. This is about the third time I've done this one, but for the last time, you start off with a population. The population is whatever group of people you're trying to deal with. This population can be teenagers, it can be adults, it could be the population of the world, it could be African Americans, it could be whatever group you're trying to look at. So, for instance, if I want to look at how do five year olds, uh, react to dogs or will a five-year-old react more positively more positively to a chihuahua or to a boxer then my population would be five-year-olds I wouldn't have any 20-year-olds in here I wouldn't have any adults I just have five-year-olds that'd be my population well once I get my population then I have to get a sample from that population and a random sample means that from those people, I'm getting a completely random one that, I, that hasn't been influenced by myself at all, whether I think it's been influenced or not. So it's completely independent of my control. And it also controls for things like age. In this case, age doesn't count because we're talking about five-year-olds. But ge gender, uh, socioeconomic status, intelligence level. If, if you have a truly random sample, all those things should be pretty even so that you won't get a whole bunch of really smart people or a whole bunch of really less intelligent people or a whole bunch of one ethnicity. You have a good random sample so that when you get your results, you know that it can be attributed to what you're trying to find and not due to the fact that you're just looking at one particular group. So from your random sample, you randomly select these people, which could be uh, maybe one out of every three. One, two, three. So he's in the group. One, two, three. Three, he's in the group, one, two, three, he's in the group, and he's in the group, okay? Now we have uh, one, two, three, four people in my group. All right, then I have to take those, <clears throat> and I have to assign them here, number three, randomly assign them to either the, what's called the experimental group, experimental, or the control group, if I'm doing an experiment here. The experimental group, is the group that's going to be receiving the variable and the control group is going to be the group that uh, doesn't receive the variable. So maybe we're going to test whether the seeing, watching a movie with dogs playing with children in it will affect how they react to seeing the boxer. Okay, so I'm going to randomly assign these people into one of these two groups. So maybe I say you're going to go here, you're going to go here, you're going to go here, and you're going to go here. So that means these two guys we have two in each group. These two are going to watch the video and because the, they're part of the experimental group. The control group, these two, are not going to watch the video. Maybe they watch, watch something on television, but it's just not about dogs. It's whatever program they would normally watch. Okay, the control group, you try not to do anything nor different out of their normal life. All right, so starting with my population up here of what I wanted to deal with, I randomly selected them. And it's usually something like drawing out of a hat, using a computer generator to select them, picking every certain number of people that walk through 
etc. Then once I get them, I assign them to either the experimental group or the control group. A correlational coefficient is a number between negative 1 and 1. So basically, if you have a 1 on either side, it's a perfect correlation, which means it's, it's cause and effect. We don't see that in real life. <clears throat> we don't see a, a 1 either way. So correlations usually do not show cause and effect. So 99.9% .9 of the time, correlations don't show cause and effect. The thing we're looking for with correlations is we're looking for the number. The bigger the number, the stronger the correlation. That's the first thing you want to remember. And the number is always going to be less than 1, but the bigger the number is less than 1. So if it's 0 0.68 or 0 0.42, this is the stronger correlation. The sign before the correlation just tells you what direction it's going in. So this is a negative or inverse correlation. This is a positive correlation. Inverse just tells you it's going down, the arrow is going down. Positive tells you the arrow is going up. <clears throat> it tells you nothing about the strength of the correlation. Remember, correlation just means relationship. So we, the sign tells us the direction, the number tells us the strength. The closer this number gets to 1, the stronger the correlation is, the, the more closely it's going towards cause and effect. Uh, continuing with correlation, we move to number five, which is the illusory correlation. This is where people think their correlation uh, exists where there isn't one. Um, and the examples I've used before, like um, watching the football game, you think wearing your favorite jersey has affected the uh, either success or failure of your team. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Another example might be you stretched before you went for a run, you usually stretch before you go for a run, and one day you don't stretch before you go for a run, you have a really good run, so you think that not stretching makes you faster, which would be an illusory correlation because we know from the body of research that um, stretching and warming up properly increases your performance. So an illusory correlation is where we get caught up and think that a correlation exists or a relationship right, exists where one doesn't. Moving on to the last five. We've got our dependent and our independent variables. We'll start with dependent because this is the first one we want to look at. The dependent variable measures the outcome or the responses of the subjects. So key word here, measures. What's being measured is your dependent variable. What's being measured or what's being counted as a response. So if I want to see... Um, which comedian makes the children laugh more? Well, what are we measuring? We're measuring how much they laugh. So laugh, in that case, would be the dependent variable. If I want to find out which dog the kids think is most cute, again, what's being measured? The cuteness level, or the level of cuteness. So that would be my dependent variable. In, e in either of those cases, the independent variable would be the other thing. <clears throat> so in the first case, was which comedian do they think is going is funnier? The comedians, comedian one or comedian two, is going to be the independent variable. Independent variable is what the experimenter changes, independent of everything else. So in an independent variable, in an experiment, the, the experimenter should control for everything else. And when we say control, that means they should try to make sure that nothing else influences the results of the subject. So for instance, um, if we're doing the comedian thing, um, we would try to use children that are uh, randomly have a random sample, randomly assign them. We try to make sure that they're all of a um, similar socioeconomic level um, and different things like that. We try to make sure they're similar in every way, and that the comedian that we show the comedians to them at the same time. We show the same clips, et cetera, et cetera. So the only thing that they're that's gonna should be affecting them is whether it was comedian one or comedian two. Um, the other example was with the level of cuteness of dogs. So <clears throat> the which dog you choose would be the independent variable. The level of cuteness would be the dependent because that's what we're measuring. Which dog it is would be the independent. The confounding variable is sometimes called an extraneous variable. Extraneous variable. And that's a variable that um, it has an unwanted influence.
So maybe I'm doing, I'm finding, I'm doing some research on something political, and I accidentally, I wanted to get a sample of all Americans, but I accidentally get a group of mostly conservative or more, mostly liberal Americans. In either of those cases, um, I, those would be confounding variables because conservatives tend to think one way, liberals tend to think another. And so that would be a confounding or extraneous variable in my research. <clears throat> Finally, the last two, some statistic stuff. Standard deviation and inferential statistics. Standard deviation is the, um, is the distance from the mean or the difference from the mean. Okay, so standard deviation is the difference from the mean. Standard deviation tells us... Um, how much variation there is in the data. The bigger the standard deviation, the more variation. The lower the standard deviation, the less variation. So generally, we want to have a low standard deviation in our results, or the lower we have, the more we could say that all the people are alike. Um, we see standard deviation on a normal curve. And once again, this is, uh, you need to know this percentage. Within one standard deviation is 68% the population and within two standard deviations is 95 percent of the population <clears throat> one SD here and one SD here that just means that in a normal curve which means you have a, a normal sample where the mean median and mode are all at the same spot and if you get a large enough sample this is what it should look like because this is completely random um, the standard deviation will, these numbers don't change regardless of the size of the standard deviation, but they're always there. Inferential statistics are techniques based on probability theory that are used to assess whether the results are reliable. So the key here is we're looking for, are they reliable? <clears throat> Do they tell us what we want them to tell us, what we think they should tell us? <coughs> they're often used to tell us whether two groups are the same or different. And you use... Um, Usually nowadays we use computer programs that we pu we type in the numbers and we tell them what formula we want to use and it pops out a significance level or inferential statistics will tell us how reliable it is. But a lot of times we'll use uh, statistical statistical significance for this class or for a intro or AP psych class. Statistical significance is really one of the only inferential statistics you look at and if we're talking about statistical significance we want to we want to shoot for something that's 0.05 or below so 0 0.04 0 0.03 <clears throat> 0 0.05 or below that tells us that when we run this statistical test that five percent of the population there's less than a five percent chance that it it was due to chance and so that if it's less than five percent that means it's pretty reliable all right so those are the top ten um, toughest terms for the research methods unit in uh, your AP or general psych class, and I hope those helped.